Welcome to the MSME Radio Network, a division of the Multiple Sclerosis Global Support Network. The following program broadcast is an original creation by the broadcast entity. Discussion within the following broadcast should be used for informational purposes only and is not a substitute for professional medical advice or consultation. Before considering application of any broadcast content in the following program, please consult your health care provider. If you feel you are having a medical emergency, please contact your local health services for immediate assistance. MSME Media and the Multiple Sclerosis Global Support Network do not guarantee or warrant the accuracy of information in the broadcast to follow. The Multiple Sclerosis Global Support Network provisions broadcast services to program hosts. Information discussed in the broadcast does not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or goals of the network and are solely those of the show broadcast hosts. Should you wish to host a broadcast, please visit our website at msmemedia.com and submit a request to become a program host. We thank you for listening to the MSME Radio Network. Enjoy the show. Hi, I'm Michael Wintink, and welcome to A Life Less Traveled. Today, we're going to discuss fate, destiny, and my path to a life less traveled. But first, I want to give you a little bit of background about me. I'm 40 years old, live in San Antonio, Texas, with my beautiful wife and and two wonderful kiddos. We've been married 16 years, and we have a son. He was born on Christmas 2006. He's 10 years old. And our daughter, who was born in June of 2009, she recently turned 8 years old. I was diagnosed with MS May 13th. 2008 it was a long journey that led to that diagnosis and I often write about that journey and being a father a husband living with MS I write about that for the National MS Society on their uh, MS Connection blog I also write for the mighty.com you can find me on Twitter at MJ Wentink MJ W E N T I-N-K, and my website is mjwentink.com. Also, every, uh, well, most Monday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, you can find me on Twitter at chatms. That's hashtag chat, C-H-A-T-M-S. So I hope that you'll be able to join in on one of those if you haven't already. But back to what we were going to speak about today. I'm often fascinated with the concept of fate and destiny. And not just in my life, in in anyone's life. If if you think about, you know, where you're living right now, who you're married to or or not married to, or, or the people that you've known in your life, all the things that had to align just perfectly to bring you to where you are at this moment in your life. And not just in your life, all the things that had to align, all the things that had to align with your parents or your grandparents or other relatives that that brought you to where you are. I grew up in the on the East Coast in, in Northern Virginia area. But, you know, just the the tiniest of things could could have happened that that could have changed the the entire trajectory of my life. My father, when he was born, his his father was, you know, in World War Two. He was jumping airborne out out of airplanes during World War Two. And just the tiniest of things that, that could have occurred were my father, maybe he would have never have met my mother. Then when I, you know, look look at his career when he was in the military and the moving around that we did and where I finally settled in high school and and where that led me, it still just amazes me that I'm at where I am today. So many different pieces had to fall into place. And I think if you think about that in your life, you're not going to maybe have a similar story as mine because everyone has their own story, but so many different pieces had to fall into place. To, to get you to where you are today and to get you where you're going to be tomorrow, a year from now, 10 years from now. 
So as I said, I, I'm quite you know fascinated with like the what ifs that you can think of, and and I think that's you know often something that I I, I think about. I uh, my wife and I w- we met each other, and w- when we met, it was after I had graduated from college. But even looking within my own personal life and how I met my wife and and got married. I go back to when I was in middle school and high school. I loved playing sports and and hanging out with friends. I liked lunch, sports, and you know, gym class. Right, like like most most teenagers, I wasn't focused as much on on the class as I should have been. I you know got good grades in high school, didn't have many issues with that, but not many of the classes that I took really you know like reached out to me, but. There was one, finally, when I think I was a sophomore or junior, I took an accounting class. And I don't know what it was, but something about accounting, it it just, it spoke to me. It spoke to me differently than a normal math class, which I I was fine with math. I liked math. I was good at it. But something about accounting was just different. And you know, I ended up taking accounting and accounting too when I was in high school, and I enjoyed both of them so much. Where when I applied to college, I applied as an accounting major. I, I mean, I didn't know why I was going. I, I just knew that I liked that class, so that was the direction I was going to go in. So I ended up uh, attending Virginia Tech, and I graduated with an accounting degree. And the next thing I know, I'm working at Capital One in their corporate tax department. Just like that. You, know, you, you make these decisions when you're 16, 17 years old. When I entered college at Virginia Tech, I was 17 years old. And, and I made a decision. I'm, I think I'm going to go into accounting. Now, of course, I could have gone to college and not and have enjoyed it as much. People switch majors. But... For whatever reason, I, I stuck with it, and that decision I made when I was 16 or 17, that kind of sent me on that course. And so there I was at Capital One, and I was in their corporate tax area. I was just 21 years old, and, and it was June of 1998 that I started there. And in November of 1998, my wife, she started working there at Capital One. Now, Capital One back then is, you know, they were a different company than what most people are probably aware of now because uh, they, they were still, you know, primarily a credit card company, but they were very young and growing, you know. They're a much larger company now. They, they were just as dynamic back then with a lot of their business ideas and, and, and concepts, but they were such a fast-growing company where, it, it still amazes me when I think back on it where my wife and I, we ended up having cubes that were basically catty corner with each other, but we are entirely different areas. I was in corporate tax and she was in corporate real estate. You know, you, you work at Capital One the time period that we did. You, you work at Capital One a couple of years later. It isn't going to be like that. And at most major companies, Fortune 500 companies or Fortune 200 companies, most major companies, you're, you're going to be sitting, you know, in different areas w- with your with your team or with your group around only tax people or different accounting people and, and whatnot. But since Capital One was growing so quick and and they had limited space, they they were just putting people where they could put people. And for one reason or another, it just so happened to work out. Was it destiny? Was it fate? where my wife met and I, we met each other and we were just sitting basically right across from each other. We started a friendship and, uh, you know, would, would talk sporadically and, and, uh, you know, oftentimes we, we joke where, uh, I, I, I still remember that, uh, you know, she was at her, her desk and, and, and I saw her going to the printer. And so as soon as she, I saw her head up to the printer. I started just, I started hitting print on my thing. I don't even know what I was printing out just so I can go meet her up there at the printer and talk to her. And, and I did that and I approached and I saw her looking at me and and the best that I could come up with was, Hey, I've seen you around. And 
it, it was a, it was a ter- it was a terrible line but for some reason she uh she started speaking with me and, and as i said we, we became uh pretty good friends and um uh, it wasn't until maybe um the following spring of 1999 it was late spring around may we were going to lunch one day and we'd been we'd gone to a few lunches together just just her and i and it was strictly just friends at that point and we were heading back from lunch going back to the office i was driving and as we approached the office we saw police cars we saw you know fire trucks and, and firemen it was all, all the, a lot of commotion was going on where, where our office was, and we had no idea what was going on. Well, as it turns out, there was actually a gas leak in our building. So our building had, in, 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 as we approached, we realized that we can't get back in. They, they'd shut our building down. They'd closed it down. So you know, she didn't, her, the keys to her car were, were, were in her desk. And still, she couldn't even get to her car anyways because it was in the parking garage there and they weren't letting anyone in. So we, she couldn't even access her car or anything. And she had a conference call with her manager who was actually at a different location. Um, so we headed back to my apartment so she can you know, get on her conference call there. And so she you know, ha- had her call and afterwards... We we're like, well, I guess I guess we're kind of done with work for the day, and I was like, well, you want to uh, maybe head down to Georgetown, which is a you know a nice little area that was nearby where we lived in in Arlington, actually Sherlington, Virginia, was where we lived. It was maybe about ten miles away from the Washington D.C. area or Washington D.C. specifically. And Georgetown's super close to where Washington, D.C. is. And I was like, you want to head down there? Maybe we can go, you know, um, you know, walk around or grab a drink or something like that. And she was like, sure, that sounds great. And so we went down there and we ended up, I think we got some ice cream down there in Georgetown. Kind of just hung out and talk and had a good time. Had a lots of laughs. And, you know, it was getting a little later in the day. And... I was like, well, you know, I, we, we need to head back because uh, as, you know, fate would actually have it, that night I had a date with someone that I had met in my apartment building. And at the time, my, my wife and I, Angela, my wife, Angela, she, uh, we had a friendship where, I mean, she would routinely help me maybe if I was telling her about a girl that I was talking to or maybe it was going to date or something, give me advice what to wear or what not to say or something like that so i mean that was just you know that was just kind of it was a routine discussion she was aware that i had the date and and so you know there's a part of me though that was a little disappointed to be heading back home um or heading back to my place and and, and getting ready for the date for that night uh so i got back to my apartment and um after dropping her off at hers and I guess I had a message on our machine there. The um, the girl that I was going to go on the date with, she she was sick. She had to bail. And so, you know, in that moment, I was like, oh, okay, that's too bad. But then I was like, well, you know, I, I think I'd rather be spending time with Angela. So I was actually kind of a little bit relieved. I, I So I quickly just call, called her right back up. And I was like, "Hey, you want you want to hang out tonight? You want to you know, get get together and and go down to Old Town, Old Town Alexandria? It's another area right near where we lived." And she was like, "Sure, you know what happened to your date?" I was like, "Well, she got sick and she wasn't able to you know get together." And then she was like, "Oh, okay." So uh, I drove and picked her up, and we went down to Old Town, and I think we grabbed some dinner down there, and. Uh, went to a neat little place nearby where we got the dinner where we were just kind of hanging out at the bar and, and just talking. And I, I still remember it to this day. We were, we were watching a baseball game, just laughing about life and, and, and drinking, drinking some dark beers together. And I realized, you know, it's like, this is, this is 
what what else do I need here? Is someone I can just be myself and we can just have so much fun together. You know, this is this is the direction I want to go in and and that's that night solidified things in my mind and in in that changed, you know, kind of the trajectory of where my life was going. I realized that I wanted to be with Angela. And so eventually, you know, we we got married a, a couple years later. And then here here we are today. But when I look back on that, it's just like it's it's amazing to think about the fate and destiny that that was involved with that. Would we have still have gotten together and gotten married? If we didn't have the gas leak, if it didn't close things down, maybe it was always supposed to be that way. Maybe that was just the way it was going to be. And so I like to just, you know, ponder things like that and think about that because I think I find things like that fascinating. Which brings me to my path, you know, fi finding my path on, on the life less traveled. A question that I often get from others when they learn that I have MS or, or find out that I was diagnosed with MS was, you know, like, well, why, you know, how, how'd you get it? And you know, it, it's a great question. The, 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 the problem is, is that I'm not really sure. <laughs> and, and even when, when I was diagnosed at, at the Mayo Clinic, uh, they, they weren't really sure, you know, either. I think there's just theories, you know, there's theories out there. There's evidence of wh why it may, you know, why I may have it. And, and there's certainly things that we can point to. For, for myself, I, I've developed a, a three-part theory of why I believe I have multiple sclerosis. But first, I, I, I have to give a caveat. I'm I'm not a doctor or a medical professional. This is these clearly this is just my opinion. Nothing more, nothing less. Um, I, I I've not take, gone to medical school, and as far as taking you know any sort of science or medical classes, as far as far as that's gone is biology, you know, one hundred and one in college, and you know I didn't do that great in it. So again, this is just. This is based on my own reading and kind of just research and thoughts in my head and nothing more, nothing less. But this is, you know, kind of the best theory that, that I've come up with, at least related to how I ended up being diagnosed with MS. I had mentioned earlier that it was a long path to get to that diagnosis, and, and it was. You know, I, I started, you know, having odd and, and, and bizarre things pop up, you know, maybe, uh, you know, I, I remember having a lot of shooting pains in my head at one point. And this was back, you know, maybe in our first few years of marriage in, in 2003 to 2004. And, and I remember the, the tingles and the numbness was kind of starting to kind of occur it wouldn't be as frequent as it is now but it would pop up here or there but oftentimes when, when these random symptoms or odd symptoms would pop up you know i go to a doctor and they do a scan or they you know take my blood and you know just end up shrugging their shoulders they, they weren't sure that they, they didn't know why or, or what it what could have been and you know at one point in fact i ended up um being misdiagnosed with Crohn's disease. We had some friends that came and visited, and this was in 2007. They came and visited us here in San Antonio, and that night, my, my buddy and I, we were hanging out talking, or, or was, you know, they'd already gone upstairs, and they, they'd gone to sleep, and I started just getting this shooting pain in my stomach, and I didn't know why. And one next thing I knew, like, I started getting the pain down my my, my arm and I didn't know maybe I was having a stroke or a heart attack I didn't know what was going on and I told my buddy I was like you got you got to wake up my wife you got to wake up Angela I, I think I need to go to the emergency room and I ended up going to the emergency room and the emergency room doctor there he kind of you know determined well I think you might you know have Crohn's disease and the next day I met with a GI doctor and they started doing a bunch of tests on me and and 
And that was his best conclusion too. He was like, I, I think that you have Crohn's. And uh, I even started being treated for it. I uh, take, uh, I believe it's called Pentasa. These like, these blue pills. It was like they were horse pills, uh, four of them. And I think I had to take them twice a day if my memory serves me. But along the way, um, I started having vision issues. At the time, didn't know it, but it was optic neuritis. And as many of you all know that have MS or know somebody with MS, optic neuritis is something that often, you know, you know, kind of leads you down that road to the diagnosis. But at the time, I wasn't aware of that, but I knew I was having some big time vision issues, blurred vision. I couldn't, you know, even no vision at some point, um, at one point. And, uh, you know, I remember going to my GI doctor and, you know, talking to him and be like, I don't think this is part of Crohn's, right? And he agreed. And, and he was like, well, I'm not against second opinion. So he, uh, he actually referred me to the Mayo Clinic and, and I went up there and, and it didn't take them long where they were able to kind of piece things together pretty quickly. I hadn't had an MRI before the Mayo Clinic. And so it was something that's why no one else had ever, you know, seen an MRI of my brain and my spine before that. So once I had got up there, I mean, overall, with all the tests that I was doing, we were probably up there for about a week. And that's when they determined that I had uh, MS and I was diagnosed. It turns out in my stomach, I uh, process food about faster than 99% of the general population. And, and I think that was leading to a lot of the GI issues that I was having at the time. So I, I take stuff now to help slow down the processing of my food. They actually wanted me to stay there at the Mayo Clinic to do a study on me. But at that point, I was like, I'm out. I got to go home. I've been here long enough. I, I, in a way, I was happy that I finally had a name to what was wrong. It was MS, but I had to, you know, I had to get home and get, get, get back to our son. You know, my wife was with me at the time, but get back to our son. But that when, when I was there, I remember asking, or I remember when the doctors asked me, they were like, uh, you know, because we lived in Je Texas at the time, and they were like, did you, um, did you ever spend time, any time on the East Coast growing up? I was like, well, yeah, as a matter, a matter of fact, I did. I, uh, you know, I'm from, you know, Virginia area, Washington, D.C. area. Even lived in Germany for a few years. And they're like, oh, okay, well, that, that makes sense. Because I was like, why? They're like, well, we, we see that there's a higher percentage or proportion of people that end up being diagnosed that they live in parts of the com country where there's less sun, like there is in Texas, you know, where, um, you know, there's less vitamin D that I'm receiving. So as I trail us back to my three-part theory, the, the first part is, is that I believe that my body, for one reason or another, my chromosomes, whatnot, my, my body, you know, ha had a predisposition to MS. And I think that people maybe are born and some people have predisposition and some people don't perhaps, but you know, my body had a predisposition. That doesn't mean that I was going to get MS. That just means that, you know, I, if certain things align the way that they did, fate or destiny, it was going to happen for me. So I had the predisposition and then I grew up for the most part living in an area that had less vitamin D uh, than other parts, you know, of the, our country or world. And then when I was in high school, I also had a really bad case of mono. And mono is, you know, formed the Epstein-Barr virus. And there's, there's mounting evidence out there where there's a, you know, a correlation to folks that have the Epstein-Barr virus and developing MS. So to be clear, you know, everyone that gets mono or, you know, doesn't get MS. You know, I, I know that. And... And, and everyone that has MS, not, not everyone that has MS has had mono in their life. So it's not a, you know, this is my three-part theory of how I got MS. You know, I, there's other stories for, for different people, maybe how it happened for them. But I believe that I had a predisposition 
and I didn't necessarily, you know, have the vitamin D that I needed growing up, or I wasn't exposed to the vitamin D that was necessary growing up. And and when I got mono, I still remember the doctor talking to me um, when I was in high school, and he was like, "You need to really take care of yourself because." this really messes with your immune system. And I mean, for some people, like their immune system never recovers from it. And that, that stuck with me, you know, because it, it was tough. Being in high school, I wanted to move around, I wanted to be with my friends, you know, I, I, wanted, I wanted to enjoy my senior year in high school, and that was hard. But I think that perhaps that's almost kind of what that got the ball rolling for me you know, I had that predisposition, if you will. Imagine like a ball rolling down a hill. I had that predisposition and I didn't have anything to stop that ball from rolling down the hill because maybe I didn't have as much vitamin D in my body as I needed. And then here comes mono along the way or Epstein-Barr virus and it kind of just takes that ball and pushes it down the hill, you know, and, and nothing could stop it there. And I think at least that's my theory that led me to my life less traveled. So we we think about it, sometimes it's kind of, you know, it's interesting, maybe it's frightening, or sometimes it's beautiful of how random life is, of how you meet the people that you do, you end up living where you are or in the career that you're in. And in my case, I, I, you know, or my case or many other people's cases that have a chronic disease like MS or, 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 or whatever it might be, it's, it's fascinating of how different random events may have led to their diagnosis or may have led them down to the road that they're on as well. I hope you enjoyed our uh, conversation today and I hope you do check me out at mjwentink.com and on Twitter at mjwentink, W-E-N-T-I-N-K. And as I said, I write for themighty.com and for the National MS Society's um, blog at the MS Connection. So I hope that you uh, check out things there and feel free to tweet at me and, and send me a note there. I'd be happy to hear from you and happy to discuss either my three-part theory more. Remember, I'm not a medical professional, just my theory. Happy to discuss this more or anything else about living with MS. But thank you for tuning in today, and I hope you check me out next time on A Life Less Traveled. Thank you.